Shalom, my name is Modi Ephraim. I'm the new ambassador of Israel to the Netherlands. On behalf of the embassy, Chai, the cultural foundation of the Jewish community of The Hague, and the municipality of The Hague, I wish to welcome you to our annual gathering commemorating the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Thank you for joining us. Every year we organize an event focusing on legal aspects related to the Holocaust. We regret that this year, yet again, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the program is conducted online. We hope that you all keep safe and healthy during these times and that next year we will be able to host an event where we can meet in person. The subject of this year's event is victims and witnesses. The program wishes to explore the issue from different angles and perspectives. However, there is a common thread between different pieces we will hear today. The important and many times courageous act of the victims in their willing to testify and tell their stories, whether in legal proceedings or other forms. As the son of Holocaust survivor Ruth, who was born in Romania and her father killed by the Nazis, I can testify firsthand that the mere retelling of the events they had witnessed is hard and sometimes result in great pain to the survivors. I wish to thank the survivors for reminding us of the past and our commitment to ensure that such horrors never happen again. I would like to thank all the participants of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day event. First, Mr. Jean Van Zanen, Mayor of the Municipality of The Hague, will provide his reflections. Later, we will then proceed to a documentary, which is also a tribute to six victims who testified in legal proceedings held after the Holocaust. Professor Eli Salzberger and Professor Dan Nichman, both the sons of Holocaust survivors who testified in the Eichmann trial, will provide short reflections regarding the role of victims as witnesses in trials after the Holocaust. Our guest address for this evening is Ms. Ellen German, the US Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues. Rabbi Emeritus Abraham Sutendorp of the liberal Jewish community of The Hague, who survived the Holocaust as a young child hidden in the Netherlands, will share with us his story. The closing remarks will be delivered by Rabbi Samuel Katzman from the High Cultural Foundation of the Jewish community of The Hague. Earlier this month, on January 20th, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution condemning the denial and distortion of the Holocaust. In the resolution, the UN member states expressed concern about the growing prevalence of Holocaust denial or distortion and agreed that the Holocaust will forever be a warning to all people of the dangers of hatred, bigotry, racism and prejudice. The testimonies provided by the survivors during the trials are significant in the fight against their attempts to deny the Holocaust. With time, there are less and less survivors who can testify and pass their memories firsthand. We have a commitment to hear their stories, remember and never forget, and fight against antisemitism and hate in any form and in any place we remember and say never again. Thank you. Reflections on historical film. The Honorable Mr. Jan van Zanen. Jan van Zanen was born in 1961 and grew up in Adam Follendam. After completing gymnasium, he studied law at the Free University of Amsterdam and Cornell Law School in Ithaca, New York. He served as mayor of Utrecht and Amstel Fein. Since July 2020, he is the mayor of The Hague. We are very pleased and proud that Mayor Van Zanen is appearing in our program for the second time. 
This year, his moving words are accompanied by special historical motion pictures. He addresses us from the Rabbi in Marstenplein, the heart of the former Jewish quarter of the Hague. This coming summer, it will be 85 years ago that the deportation of Jewish citizens from the Hague II began. In less than 10 months, more than 12,000 Jewish men, women and children were transported and killed. The systematic murder of the Hague's Jewish citizens was, and still is, one of the greatest horrors ever to have befallen this city. However, the Nazis did not succeed in their attempt to extinguish centuries of Jewish life in our city. There is still a thriving Jewish community in The Hague, even today. Although, of course, it is much smaller than it was before the Second World War. In 1940, The Hague was the home to the Netherlands' second largest Jewish community. And the pain of losing so many lives is still palpable, even after all these years. After the war, very few traces remained of all those who had perished in the concentration and death camps. Their possessions had been looted and many signs of their presence had disappeared. Every photo, every document or object serves as a valuable reminder of the victims and a warning of what racism can lead to. The film collection that was donated to the Hague Municipal Archive at the end of last year is therefore all the more remarkable. It consists of more than two hours of footage recorded between 1938 and 1942 by the Hague butcher and amateur filmmaker Maurits van Kleef. Almost 80 years later, his family donated the films to the Municipal Archive, which has had them digitized. Today, we live in an era in which making videos using our smartphones, for example, is nothing out of the ordinary. But at that time, not many people owned a film camera. We can also count ourselves lucky that Maurits van Kleef's films survived the war and the many years since then. Maurits himself was arrested, deported and murdered in Mauthausen. His wife, young son and baby daughter miraculously survived the hardships of the war. But his wife died shortly afterwards due to illness. What makes this legacy on celluloid so special? Today, in 2022, it offers us a unique but also moving glimpse of Jewish life in The Hague in those days. Particularly given the fact that Maurits shot some of the footage when the Netherlands was already occupied and the Nazi menace was rapidly approaching. In the films we see Maurits himself, of course, his family and his butcher shop on Hobbemaplein. And there's also footage of him on the football field and at the cattle market. But Maurits also filmed other people, family, friends and acquaintances. For example, the wedding of a young Jewish couple, Aaron Kosman and Kitty Fresco, even in the spring of 1941. A citizen of The Hague helped to identify them. Aaron and Kitty did not survive the horrors of the war. Or the family of Barend Sander de Groot, for example, who, together with his wife, ran a fabric and haberdashery shop in the old Jewish quarter of The Hague, just a stone's throw away from where our town hall stands today. Like Maurits, they were hard-working business owners with sweet young daughters all of them happily smiling at the camera. Two years later, in June 1943, the whole family was murdered in Sobibor. When the municipal archive 
received this film, it was not known who was on it. Further, to a public campaign, Barend Sander de Groot, his wife, Eva Allegro, and their daughters, Anna and Theodora, could be identified. The Hague will never forget them. Just as we fondly remember Maurits van Kleef, his wife, Lena Boekdrukker, and all the other 12,000 victims of the Holocaust from The Hague. Even, even if it's only their name which still lives on. Elie Wiesel famously said, for the dead and the living, we must bear witness. For the world outside, it is impossible to imagine what went on in there. For those who survived to ascend and take the stand called for admirable courage and commitment. Today, we are at the Netherlands Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, the NEOD, to pay tribute to six individuals who heeded the call to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. People whose testimony caused some of the perpetrators to face justice and challenged society with the implications of their horrific real-life experiences. There were many, in many countries, who confronted evil and injustice in this manner. Today, our spotlight is limited to the symbolic number six. We focus on six individuals whose Holocaust experience started in the Netherlands and was ultimately conveyed on the witness stand. Through the stories, of Anatje Fels, Ben Sayes, Josef Michman, Charlotte Salzberger, Jules Schelfis, and Rudi Curtisus, we honor the memory of six million victims who perished in the Holocaust. For the soul of man is a candle of God. Rudi Curtisus, one of these brave individuals who refused to allow darkness to cloak his past, will light the candles bringing light into a world so desperately in need for more light. For the dead and for the living, we must bear witness. Annetje Fels, I, I never met her and I'm so very sorry that I never had the opportunity to meet her because when you look at all the things that she did after being liberated, after being repatriated to the Netherlands, she is a great source of inspiration. Not only was she a founding member of the Dutch Auschwitz Committee, uh, she always uh, very much was dedicated to the memory and the commemoration of the Shoah, but also in uh, information, uh, education about the Shoah, uh, about acknowledging what happened and about justice being repaired. In 1956, Karl Klauberg, who was the gynecologist of Auschwitz, well, a so-called gynecologist, he experimented in Auschwitz on thousands of women. And he was exchanged in the 50s from a Soviet prison back to Germany and then he was accused and in order to prepare the trial against Karl Klauberg the International Auschwitz Committee called upon all the all the branches of the Auschwitz committees in the different countries to look for possible witnesses at a trial against Klauberg and that's when Anitje Fels uh, really became the founding member of the Dutch Auschwitz Committee. So the reason for the Auschwitz Committee in the Netherlands uh, to become a, a foundation, which it is still today, uh, is laying in the fact that a criminal of Nazi crimes was put on trial in Germany. Klauberg um, uh, never faced the judge. He died in the preparation of his trial in prison and there was never a process, a trial against him. Uh, but the Dutch Auschwitz committee was established and um, the, the, the speaker and the chair became Annetje Fels. There were two other occasions when Annetje Fels played a very important role in bringing to justice or keeping punished 
Nazi perpetrators. Uh, the first, uh, of course, being uh, the Auschwitz trials as they were held in Frankfurt in the 60s, where she performed uh, the role as a, a witness during those trials. Having survived Auschwitz and the death marches, she explained what happened in Germany. In the Netherlands, there were already trials against Nazi criminals as early as the late 40s. In the prison of Breda, originally four, but later three uh, Nazi criminals were kept prison until in 1972, the then Minister of Justice, Dries van Acht, took the initiative to pardon them. And the pardon that he wanted uh, to give them had to be uh, agreed upon in the Dutch Parliament. Now a special hearing was organized in the Dutch Parliament and during that hearing not only Professor Bastians, who is specialized in the trauma caused by these criminals to the victims was heard, but also Annetje Fell spoke and she spoke from her heart and she touched many and the vote as was prepared by Dries van Acht switched as a result of her testimony the three of Breda were not pardoned in 1972, thanks to her and her witness role during that parliamentary hearing. Annetje Fels did much more than looking for justice and acknowledgement. She fought for education, she fought for memory, for recognition. She brought survivors together and able to support each other. And as such, uh, as a survivor, as a representative of her generation, uh, as a woman, she's a great source of inspiration to me. My colleague from the Netherlands Institute for War Documentation, Ben Seijs, was a very emotional man. He testified as an expert witness in Vienna in 1965 against the war merchant Dr. Erich Jajakovic, who was suspected of having organized deportation of Jews from the Nazi-occupied Netherlands. In the witness stand, Ben Seyers practically lost his voice. He could barely whisper. The excellent biographer of Seyers, Richter Roegold, has described what Seyers, a self-made intellectual son of the Amsterdam Jewish proletariat, which was completely murdered in the Nazi death camps, felt at the time. Through his voice, others whispered. His sister and her husband, both of his parents, his grandfather, and all the family members, friends and neighbors from the poverty-stricken Amsterdam Jewish Quarter who had been killed in the camps, they whispered through him. At the end of the day, Ryakovic was convicted, but Seyers fell ill, seriously ill. The fears he had experienced living underground as a Jewish fugitive under Nazi occupation returned to him with terrifying force. Before that, Seyers, who had not graduated from university, has worked as a laborer in the Amsterdam shipping yard. And his proletarian, very leftist but non-communist background, together with his experiences in the shipyard, go a long way into explaining his sensitivity for the plight of the laboring forces under Nazi occupation. This very non-academic man published four wonderful books on the Dutch laboring classes under occupation. A book on the February strike of 1941, a book on the April Mill a May strike of 1943, a book on a Nazi raid in Rotterdam in 1944, and a book on Dutch forced laborers in Germany. But as an expert witness against Ryakovic and against Adolf Eichmann, Seyers demonstrated his precision as a historian with a talent for legal matters as well. This rare combination of talents fully justified his appointment of this leftist radical as a professor at Leiden University, which as you know is a traditional bulwark of the Dutch bourgeoisie. Back in the 90s, when I was working and living in Israel, I had the privilege of working together on a large research project with Jo Michman, or Josef Melkman, as he was born in Amsterdam. 
And Yom Ichman lived in Jerusalem. I lived up north in Israel. And every Tuesday I used to travel to his home in order to work on the, on the things that we did. Yo Michman was not only a survivor of the Shoah, of the Holocaust, um, but he also um, emigrated uh, to Israel in the 50s and became one of the first directors of Yad Vashem. Uh, so he was a scholar and extremely knowledgeable about the history of the Shoah, not only in theory from books and archives, but also as a survivor. Now one Tuesday I I came over to Jerusalem to work with him a full day uh, and it was different than all the other days I used to do that. And the difference was that he was dressed different. He was uh, waiting for me in his uh, home all dressed up in a woolen suit, far too warm for the Israeli climate. And he explained to me that he had a lecture uh, later on that day and that he was already dressed up uh, uh, for his audience. And then he told me that it was a suit that he had already for a long, long time. Uh, he wore it when he was a witness at the trial uh, of Eichmann in 1961. Adolf Eichmann, of course, one of the perpetrators of the Shoah, was taken to Israel uh, by the Israeli intelligence and stood trial in 1961 in Beta Am in Israel. Yo Michman uh, was invited by Gideon Hausner, the prosecutor of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem, to testify about the persecution of Jews in the, ne in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Josef Michman was of course a scholar. He knew uh, as a researcher uh, well uh, what to testify and what occurred during the persecution. In his testimony, he added also personal memories of what happened to him and to his wife, the things he saw and the things he experienced, the humiliation. Here he was in Bet Ha'am in 1961, in May. It must have been a warm spring day, all dressed up. So for him and his wife, apparently as well, it was very important that he would face Eichmann in the court being a very civilized man, so he dressed up, dignified, very much in contrast of all the experiences he had during the Shoah. So here in this house of the people, the Bet Ha'am, which functioned as a court, he symbolized civilization yet again, after the war, after the Shoah. Now when you look at some of the footage that was taken during the Eichmann trial, you see him uh, um, uh, telling uh, about the Shoah as it occurred in the Netherlands. And you also sometimes get a glimpse of the audiences. And most of the people in the audience also dressed up. For them it was very special. For them it was a statement to confront themselves with one of the perpetrators uh, that caused so much trauma in this court in the state of Israel, being civilized, being dignified, human. My name is Eli Salzberger. Uh, I was born in Jerusalem uh, to Lotte Salzberger, who was the witness at the Reichmann trial. My mother was born in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, in uh, 1923 to an ultra-orthodox family uh, with a very comfortable life. My grandfather was a businessman, he became a partner. Everything changed in 1933 when the Nazis came to power and my grandfather Leo decided to move the whole family to Amsterdam. They were arrested on a Saturday morning just before sitting for breakfast in their house uh, and were deported first to uh, uh, Westerbrook and from there my grandmother, mother and sister uh, to Ravensbrück. Next is a very interesting part of the story where uh, there was an order to move my mother and her sister from Ravensbrück to Theresienstadt. And this was already quite late towards the end of the war. An SS officer appeared in Ravensbrück 
with this warrant and took these two teens uh, to, with him in public transportation and were told that a very important person will come to interview them. Uh, they were held there about uh, a week before this officer, this uh, person came to interview them and this was Adolf Eichmann. He wanted to know what would they know about the final solution and he asked them, they uh, said that they don't know anything and he said to them that if they will tell anything that they know in the ghetto, they will go up the chimney. And this was a very important key testimony afterwards in the Eichmann trial. 1960, Adolf Eichmann was captured and brought to trial. And my mother was a key witness in this trial because of this personal encounter and his inquiry about the final solution, which were very important piece of evidence that he himself knew about the final solution and tried to hush it up. My mother came out of this trial um, with much more vigor uh, to accomplish what she saw her life mission uh, as helping people, not only Holocaust survivors. She later became a deputy mayor of Jerusalem uh, and uh, established uh, the borough system in Jerusalem. Uh, she founded, uh, during the first intifada, the hotline for uh, helping Palestinian victims of Israeli police and forces. Some people became very nationalistic and self-centered. Others became very univer universalistic uh, and aiming to help the other. My mother was in the latter camp. And I think this is also one of the ramifications of her testimony in the Eichmann trial and putting the Holocaust uh, in a very different light. I would like to introduce to you Jules Schelvis. Schelvis was a co-plaintiff in two German trials against perpetrators from Sobibor death camp. As a young man, he survived both the Sobibor and the Birkenau death camps. That was impossible, but he did it. Like Ben Seyers, the social democrat Jules Schelvis came from the working classes of Jewish Amsterdam. And during his transport to Sobibor in 1943, Jules Schelvis brought his guitar with him. He imagined that after working hours in Sobibor, there would be outdoor campfires, sing-alongs, and merry guitar playing. But in Sobibor, his wife, Rachel Borsikowski, was murdered upon arrival. The last 35 years of his long and fruitful life, from 1980 to his death, Schelvis wrote and spoke about Sobibor death camp without ever taking a break. He was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Amsterdam in 2008 because of his book on Sobibor. And the moment he took a break, in 2016, he died. In a truly moving speech on May 4, 2020, the Dutch king William Alexander remembered Jules Schelvis. He described his testimony as the one he would never ever forget. Schelvis had asked himself during his speech why nobody made an effort to protest against the deportation of the Jews. Schelvis described the segregation of the Jews as a process that once started was practically impossible to stop. Sobibor began in the Amsterdam Vondelpark, the king said. The king also stated that it's our duty not to look away when our fellow citizens are marginalized. Do not accept as normal what is not normal. Only by respect for and defense of our democracy can we protest and protect ourselves against arbitrary politics and racial madness. The king emphasized that selfish had never lost faith in humanity, even in the death camps. As an atheist humanist and a social democrat, Schelvis would have agreed with the king. And my guess is that he would have been very content with this praise coming from the king. He would have chuckled to himself, I think. And this speech of our king 
Well, this speech makes me proud to be a Dutchman. I'm Rudy Cortisos. First of all, I should explain to you that Rudy is not my name. Rudy is the name my parents gave me during the war when I was hidden. And uh, by tomorrow, I will be 83 years of age. I have a uh, nice family, a uh, wife, two children, four grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. As far as the Holocaust is concerned, um, and my connection with this period is uh, the um, uh, Lem Jong Yuk trial. My mother was cast by Dem Yuk in 1943, together with uh, 62 other members of my family, both in Sobibor and in Auschwitz. The last thing I could do for my mother was to be present four times during the Demjanjuk trial. We were all together with 21 Dutch um, co-plaintiffs. It's difficult to um, s explain my feelings when entering that courtroom. Five German judges, uh, all dressed in black, Assistants dressed in black, the Red Cross, police uh, to guard the Mianyuk. I can't forget, I can never forget, when I um, showed the court the letter my mother wrote in the train to Sobibu, explaining, telling her husband, her son, that um, uh, she was on her way to the east. She was uh, um, together with 70 other people in the train wagon. Um, some of them, some of them she knew, but it was a mess, not knowing where they were going, how long it would take, etc. That letter was thrown out of the, uh, of the train between uh, Assen and Nieveshans, the border. President of the uh, court asked me whether he could have that letter. So I answered, no, you can't have it. You can see it. And he understood very well what it meant to me. I explained to everybody that when I'm at the dentist office and um, they um, treat my teeth, my thoughts, go back to um, Sobibor and Auschwitz where they pulled out the golden crowns, the golden teeth of everybody. When I am um, getting up at night to do a pee, -pee I think of the train where each a uh, wagon had two tons, one for water, one to be used as a toilet. My thoughts go back to that moment. Um, so this was, in fact, my proof to the judges. It is very important that generations after me are being informed by 
survivors of the Holocaust because it plays a role every day. It still plays a role every day. Professor Eli Salzberger is a professor at the University of Haifa, Faculty of Law. Professor Salzberger was the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Haifa from 2005 until 2009, the President of the European Association for Law and Economics, and the Director of the Haifa Center for German and European Studies. His research and teaching areas, among other fields, are legal theory and philosophy, and economic analysis of law. He has published more than 40 scientific articles and books. Currently, he has the Minerva Center for the Study of the Rule of Law under Extreme Conditions. His first encounter with the legal word was the Eichmann trial in 1961. His mother, Lotte Salzberger, was one of the witnesses whom we are honoring in this year's tribute. After this short uh time in Theresienstadt. Uh, they were liberated by the Russian forces who ordered them not to leave, but my mother and sister decided to escape and hitchhike to Prague. From there, they returned to Amsterdam. And to their surprise, they discovered that unlike most of the Jews, the house of my mother was kept exactly how it was before the war, before they were arrested, the dishes for Saturday morning breakfast were laid around the table. And it happened to be afterwards that uh, the next door neighbor, who was the Hungarian ambassador, told the Nazis this is a Hungarian territory because my grandmother came originally from Chopron and uh, prevented them from entering, looting, confiscating the house. <clears throat> That this brought my mother and sister uh, after the war to establish a commune in, in their apartment and hosted three other families uh, that did not find their home uh, when they returned from the camps. But after a while, my mother and sister um, thought, you know, this is not the Amsterdam that we grew up in. Most of our friends are gone. This is not the place that we can continue to live. And uh, my mother went to study uh, at Columbia University, and from there she immigrated to Israel, the newly established state, in the early 50s. Um, as a lesson from the Holocaust and from their experience, my mother decided to study social work and to dedicate her life to help others. When uh, she came to Israel. She was one of the founders of the School for Social Work at the Hebrew University, where she taught until she passed away. You know, Hannah Arendt wrote that uh, this was, that the trial of Eichmann was a showcase, and I think she got it wrong. The Eichmann trial was a trial, according to all uh, parameters uh, of justice. It was indeed broadcast live to the public and everybody listened to the radio. Uh, but uh, unlike show trials in which the government decides who will be 
the prosecutor, who will be the defender, who will be the witnesses, and what will be the final outcome. This was a real trial with a lot of testimonies to tell the story. It did uh, play an educational role as well. Until the Eichmann trial, stories from the Holocaust were not told. In many families, parents did not tell their children what did they go through. This was not the case with my mother as a very uh, character, uh, characteristic yeke. She told us from a very young age all the stories of her adventures and uh, uh, upbringing. But for many families, uh, for the wide population in Israel, the Eichmann trial was a big revelation from which point people told the stories, were not ashamed of their uh, experiences, and the Holocaust, the survivors, uh, um, got a total different attention in Israel. They transformed the discourse about uh, the Holocaust in Israel, but it maintained all the features of a, a trial. Professor Dan Michman is head of the International Institute for Holocaust Research and Incubement of the John Nyman Chair of Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem. He is an emeritus professor of modern Jewish history and the former chair of the Arnold and Leona Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research and Incubement of the Abraham and Edita Spiegel Family Chair in Holocaust Research at Bar Ilan University. Born in Amsterdam in 1947, he emigrated to Israel with his family in 1957. In 1978, he wrote his dissertation, Jewish Refugees from Germany in the Netherlands, 1933-1940. In 1976, he joined Bar Ilan University, teaching and researching in the field of modern Jewish history in general, and the Shoah in particular. His father, Yosef Michman, then Melkman, served as the general director of Yad Vashem from 1957 till 1960 and testified at the Eichmann trial. My name is Dan Michman. Uh, my father Hebraized our name from Melkman originally into Michman. And I'm uh, head of the International Institute for Holocaust Research of Yad Vashem and emeritus professor of modern Jewish history with focus on the Holocaust at Bar Ilan University, Ramat Gan, Israel. My parents uh, survived the Holocaust. They were uh, born in Amsterdam and they were uh, deported in 1943, first to Westerbork and then uh, to the Bergen-Belsen uh, concentration camp. They were liberated in Eastern Germany by uh, the Red Army and returned uh, to the Netherlands. And then first of all, they had to find my brother who was hidden. Right? And then there were other relatives because uh, my grandmother and two aunts were exchanged in 1944 for Germans, Templars from uh, Eretz Israel, from Palestine. Uh, and one of these aunts had a, had a boy who was hidden in the Netherlands. So they tried to trace him and found him and brought him then also back and uh, they took in the children of m two children of my aunt uh, who were also hidden and uh, so they had to rebuild the family and uh, and to uh, rehabilitate themselves and then uh, they uh, also uh, contributed to the reconstruction of the Dutch jury my father was uh, uh, head of the uh, Zionist Federation in the Netherlands. He was also the editor of the Jewish Weekly, the NEV. He learned and also also made inquiries. Uh, was, for instance, a, a very uh, famous, infamous affair that happened in the in the Netherlands, and that was the case of Anneke Beekman. Anneke Beekman was a child that was hidden. Uh, by two Catholic uh, women uh, and they didn't want to return the child. 
uh, and there was a whole inquiry and they smuggled the, the child out of the Netherlands and she's still living in the s south of France, but that was a whole affair in the Netherlands and my father was involved also through, uh, through the Jewish community and it was even so that the police uh, uh, came to the home where uh, Annika Beckman was hidden for a while and they found a warm bed. She was taken just minutes before outside the home and smuggled out of the country. So my father was involved in all these issues and new aspects of, uh, of the uh, war orphans and perpetration and uh, the, the people who chaired the Jewish council and so on and so forth. We came to Israel in 1957 when my father was appointed as director general of Yad Vashem and therefore he was well known to the prosecution here as a prominent person who knows about the Holocaust in uh, the Netherlands. And uh, after Eichmann was captured and brought to Israel and the uh, trial was prepared, uh, people of the prosecution, actually uh, uh, attorney Gabriel Bach, uh, came uh, to our home to uh, ask my father if he would be ready to testify in, uh, in the trial. And um, actually my father told that uh, he hadn't met Eichmann personally, uh, but he knew of course a lot about uh, the Holocaust in, in the Netherlands, also from his uh, personal experience and uh, from his uh, position at Yad Vashem later on. And so he was recruited as uh, the witness for the case of the Netherlands uh, in the Eichmann trial. I think that the testimonies in uh, trials, in trials of uh, criminals uh, of the Holocaust, and of course on, also in, in other cases of uh, genocide, play an important role. This was not the case already during the uh, Nuremberg trials. The number of witness witnesses was very limited. Uh, only later on, uh, and uh, this change, and the Eichmann trial was very important uh, in this, uh, because there was a, a series of people who testified in, uh, in, in the trial. And uh, although the documentation was for the trial itself at that moment much more important, uh, for the public resonance of the trials, this was very important. Uh, but there is more to it, and that is also later on, because there are a lot of things uh, that uh, occur during the Holocaust and occur also in other genocides that are not documented. That's the nature of these kind of things. And so when you have testimonies, that is very important, especially if you have several testimonies, because together they can uh, depict a picture that can be used also in the trial itself when documentation is lacking. Um, and we can see that later on in trials in the 1970s and 1980s, already in the 1960s actually, uh, this change uh, occurred. Uh, and in recent years, uh, it has been embraced much more. And we can see that uh, for uh, criminal cases, this is, can sometimes also be uh, decisive for, for instance, regarding the, the war in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. Uh, testimonies are very important also for the public uh, dimension of trials because it's not a document, it's a person who tells about uh, his or her experience uh, and that is of uh, great importance uh, for understanding for the public to understand the, the seriousness uh, of the cases. And uh, I can tell that it is also important for uh, research, for uh, inquiry committees and for uh, scholars, for historians. One of the leading historians on the Holocaust is uh, Christopher Browning. And uh, he wrote already in 1992 a very important study, uh, Ordinary Men, in which he used uh, the testimonies of perpetrators of a, uh, a police battalion, 101, 
uh, that killed uh, or was uh, act actually uh, responsible for the killing of some 80,000 uh, Jews. And now from their testimonies during the inquiry towards the trial, uh, he learned a lot about the interaction between them and what happened and so on, things that you could not learn from the survivors. On the other hand, he also later on wrote a very important uh, study uh, on a forced labor camp in Poland, Starachowice, and there he used a lot of testimonies by survivors about the conditions in the camp and so on, and from them you could learn about the perpetrator things that were not documented, not recorded, and also not told by the perpetrators themselves later on when they were arrested. So the role of uh, testimonies is of, of great importance. Of course, you have al always to take into account that uh, memory uh, can shift things and uh, it cannot be uh, always uh, so precise. But if you have a cluster of testimonies that is uh, that uh, adds up and can complement documentation and sometimes uh, is the only way to understand what happened at a certain moment. The Honorable Miss Ellen Germain, Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues. Ellen Germain assumed her duties as Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues on August 23, 2021. Special Envoy Germain was head of the U.S. Consulate General in Krakow for three years, where she worked closely with Jewish groups in southwest Poland and with officials at the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial and Museum. She was posted to the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv and served as Senior Political Officer in the Office of Israel-Palestinian Affairs and as deputy political counselor at the U.S. mission to the U.N. in New York, where her responsibilities included managing the team that worked on resolutions relating to Israel in the Security Council and General Assembly. Since assuming her current position, she has participated in many conferences in many European venues to speak out against Holocaust denial and distortion. It is an honor to have a distinguished member of the U.S. State Department join us this year. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this important event. I'm honored to be talking to such a distinguished audience. I want to thank Rabbi Shmuel Katzman and Chai, the Municipality of The Hague, and the Israeli Embassy for organizing this commemoration. I was asked to talk about a topic of my own choosing, but one that took into consideration the ethical, religious, or moral dimensions of the aftermath of the Holocaust. After a lot of thought and discussion, I decided to focus on Holocaust denial and distortion. Passage of the UN General Assembly Resolution on Combating Holocaust Denial and Distortion on January 20th is just more evidence of the importance of this issue. It seems incredible that more than 75 years after the end of World War II and the Holocaust, people still deny and distort the facts of the genocide one of the best documented mass atrocities in human history. We have mountains of evidence, extensive survivor testimonies, and eyewitness accounts from those who liberated the concentration and death camps. Yet Holocaust denial and distortion persist. Indeed, one could say they have gone viral. Modern day Holocaust distortion and denial have been exacerbated and amplified through the use of digital tools and the ease with which misinformation and disinformation can be spread on social media platforms. This is shocking. The Holocaust is fact. The evidence is overwhelming. So what's going on? Why does it matter? And what can we do about it? Well, first, some definitions. According to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, Holocaust denial seeks to erase the history of the Holocaust, in doing so, it seeks to legitimize Nazism and anti-Semitism. Holocaust distortion acknowledges aspects of the Holocaust as factual. It nevertheless excuses, minimizes, or misrepresents the Holocaust in a variety of ways and through various media. The United States, alongside the Netherlands, is a proud member of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IRA 
and I want to acknowledge the excellent work that Ira has done on identifying and countering Holocaust denial and distortion. Indeed, Ira's working definition of antisemitism, which the United States embraces and encourages other countries to embrace, identifies Holocaust denial and distortion as forms of antisemitism, and their increase is particularly relevant in the context of rapidly rising antisemitism around the world. I've drawn extensively on Ira's work for this talk, and I want to especially thank Dr. Robert Williams and other members of the U.S. delegation to Ira for their invaluable help and suggestions. I was in Malmö, Sweden last October for the International Forum on Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Antisemitism. During the opening session, Holocaust survivor Tobias Ravit talked about how hearing a Holocaust denier made him realize he had to bear witness to what had happened. He said that when he was 56 years old, he heard a Holocaust denier on television, and it felt as if that person was saying that Mr. Ravitt's life was a lie, as if his cousins and other family members had never lived and never been murdered during the Holocaust. So he decided that he had to start speaking up and sharing his experience of the Holocaust. Born in Poland, Mr. Ravitt was taken to the Łódź ghetto with his parents when he was three years old and then deported to the Ravensbrück concentration camp. Miraculously, he and his parents survived, but much of his extended family was murdered. Mr. Ravitt's story of why he decided to bear public witness to the Holocaust was incredibly moving, and it showed us in a few words how Holocaust denial tries to erase the suffering of Holocaust survivors and tries to wipe out the historical reality of the murder of six million Jews by the Nazis and their collaborators. Professor Deborah Lipstadt, an eminent historian of the Holocaust, said it very clearly. Quote, the Holocaust has the dubious distinction of being the best documented genocide in the world. For deniers to be right, all survivors would have to be wrong. One example of Holocaust distortion is the rehabilitation of people who played roles in committing the crimes of the Holocaust. Some, like Jonas Noreka in Lithuania and Roman Shukhevich in Ukraine, are considered national heroes because they fought against Soviet tyranny, but they also collaborated with the Nazis. Some countries have named sports stadiums after na Nazi collaborators. But all countries, the United States included, need to face up to the reality of their history, both the bad as well as the good. Indeed, my own country took steps that made it more difficult for Jews fleeing the Holocaust to enter the United States. Another example of Holocaust distortion is the use of Holocaust imagery or language for political or ideological purposes. This can trivialize and demean the Holocaust. A recent example is the yellow stars worn by anti-COVID vaccination protesters in the United States and Europe. The Nazis forced Jews to wear yellow stars of David on their clothing so they could be easily identified in order to harass and isolate Jews, force them into ghettos, round them up, deport them, and kill them. It's crazy to have to say this, but that is not comparable to the inconvenience of not being allowed to, answer, to enter a restaurant because you chose not to be vaccinated. Some politicians in both the United States and in the Netherlands have compared COVID-19 restrictions to the persecutions suffered by the Jews in the Holocaust. These false comparisons distort the Holocaust's significance as a uniquely horrific effort to systematically annihilate an entire people. They harm our democratic institutions by comparing measures taken to protect public health and save lives to measures taken by the Nazis to cold-bloodedly target and murder six million Jews. Holocaust distortion can also involve minimizing the impact of the Holocaust or claiming that fewer people were killed than has been established by overwhelming evidence. Holocaust distortion is a form of anti-Semitism and it feeds more anti-Semitism. And of course, the Holocaust is the most horrifying example of the destruction and death to which unchecked hatred can lead. 
Countering Holocaust denial and distortion matters because all efforts to downplay or blur the facts of what happened and who was complicit are insults to the victims and survivors of the Holocaust. It matters because it further perpetuates anti-Semitism. It matters because it can also fan the flames of violent extremism. One terrible example from the United States is the gunman who killed 11 people in a synagogue in the United States in 2018. He frequented a social media platform that trafficked in Holocaust denial and other forms of anti-Semitism. Countering Holocaust denial and distortion matters because they threaten our ability to understand and learn from the history of the Holocaust. We often say that we must teach about the Holocaust and learn from it so that no such depravity is ever permitted to happen again. Never again is one of the most important moral lessons the world can draw from the Holocaust. But the world has been far from perfect in applying this lesson. Mass atrocities throughout the world, such as the genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Darfur, and Xinjiang show that very clearly. But we're trying to do better, including by bringing a measure of justice through efforts to support war crimes units and international investigative mechanisms and courts, like those in The Hague. Our efforts to prevent and deter atrocities also include peacekeeping operations and, importantly, education. The United States, for example, supports programs to teach teachers how to train teachers to teach about the Holocaust and supports exchange programs for teachers, civil society, law enforcement, and others to learn about confronting anti-Semitism and Holocaust distortion and denial. Education means not only teaching the facts of the Holocaust and other genocides and mass killings, but also teaching tolerance and inclusivity so that maybe, in the future, people will be less inclined to discriminate against and otherwise harm or even kill those who are different from them. And that kind of education has been shown to have positive associations. The Anti-Defamation League, the University of Southern California's Shoah Foundation, and Yad Vashem did a survey in 2020 of American University students. The survey looked at the relationship between Holocaust education and students' behavior and attitudes. Students who had received Holocaust education in their high school classes not only did better in their historical knowledge of the Holocaust, they also had more pluralistic attitudes and were more open to differing viewpoints. They were also more willing to challenge intolerant behavior in other people. Correlation is not cause and effect, of course, but those survey results at least offer some hope that teaching about the Holocaust can have positive effects on people's behavior in the real world. One of the real challenges encountering Holocaust denial and distortion is that such efforts inevitably get caught up in debates about freedom of expression. Many European countries have laws criminalizing Holocaust denial and promotion of Nazi ideology. The United States, on the other hand, does not criminalize hate speech of any kind, including Holocaust denial and promotion of Nazi ideology, as odious as they may be. In fact, in the United States, the First Amendment to the Constitution broadly protects speech, including offensive speech from government regulation. In a seminal court case that tested the limits of free speech, in 1977, a group of neo-Nazis sought a permit to demonstrate carrying Nazi banners in downtown Skokie, a Chicago suburb that was nearly half Jewish and home to hundreds of Holocaust survivors. The attorney who represented the neo-Nazis, who was himself a Jew, saw the issue as clear-cut because, quote, if the government can prevent lawful speech because it is offensive and hateful, then it can prevent any speech that it dislikes, end quote. In the end, although the courts ultimately ruled that the neo-Nazis had a right to peaceful assembly, the demonstration took place in downtown Chicago rather than in the town of Skokie. It was a very controversial case, but it illustrates quite clearly that in the United States, even abhorrent and hateful speech is protected. Indeed, in the United States tradition, the answer to bad speech 
including racist, anti-Semitic, Holocaust-denying, and distorting speech, is not government intervention or censorship, but more speech, speech that promotes tolerance and counters lies with facts. Internet and social media platforms are now the subject of debate about regulation of content. As a general matter, US law does not require digital platforms or services to regulate user content online that's protected under the First Amendment. So in the United States, that means social media platforms are not liable for content posted by third parties. We might ask, should co social media companies be responsible for the information that people post on their sites? Should they be held responsible for the results of algorithms that incite hatred and violence? Should companies be regulated to limit their ability to do those things? Governments are trying to figure out how to deal with these thorny questions while respecting and protecting freedom of expression. In the meantime, some platforms have taken some actions against online Holocaust denial and distortion. In late 2020, Facebook finally agreed to take down posts that deny or distort the Holocaust and to direct users to authoritative sources when they search for information. And by the way, I tested that out myself by searching for Holocaust and Holocaust hoax on Facebook. And each time I was directed to reliable sources. Twitter followed Facebook's lead and banned Holocaust denial posts. But everyone acknowledges that it's extremely difficult to find and remove all instances of Holocaust distortion and denial. I also want to acknowledge that online platforms can be powerful tools for spreading truth. They pose a challenge to authoritarian regimes and can help amplify voices of peaceful dissent. Russia recently fined Google $100 million for systematic failure to remove banned content, which included posts related to peaceful political opposition. The People's Republic of China has sophisticated controls to block websites and censor content, including about the ongoing genocide in Xinjiang. And so, while the internet and social media help spread Holocaust denial and distortion, they also make it easier to publicly spread accessible, accurate information about the Holocaust and to disseminate important information about serious violations of human rights. In conclusion, Holocaust denial and distortion not only deny and distort historical fact, they are antithetical to our democratic values. Accurate historical education and truthful commemoration of the Holocaust teach new generations about our past and the horrors to which unbridled hate can lead. So what can we do about this? As we commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day, we must do all we can every day to counter Holocaust denial and distortion and other modern manifestations of anti-Semitism and other forms of hate. We must stand up for the truth and promote the accurate and truthful history of the horrors of the Holocaust. We must highlight the painful lessons of the Holocaust, including the importance of respecting the human rights and dignity of people who are different from us. That is the only way we will ever fulfill our solemn pledge of never again. Thank you. Avram Sutendorp is Rabbi Emeritus of the Liberal Jewish Community in The Hague. He has served his community for more than five decades. As Vice Chairman of the Global Forum of Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders, he is very active on the global scene, promoting human rights and sustainability. He is an activist, a thinker, a writer, a poet, and a teacher. Born in Amsterdam in 1943, in the midst of the razzias and deportations, his testimony recalls the bravery of his parents, who entrusted him as a young baby to their resistance to be brought to safety and about being reunited with his parents after the end of World War II. My testimony today is filled with love and reverence for our fellow Jews who were killed during the Shoah. Zichonam Livracha, their memory an enduring blessing, and dedicated to those rescuers who were prepared even to pay with their lives for our safety. Babies, 
like me and my beloved wife, Sira. End of May, one of the last big razzias in the Retiefstraat in the east of Amsterdam. They broke also through our door. My father stood frozen next to the packed suitcases, too late. He had been a brilliant student at a rabbinic seminary in Amsterdam, a spiritual leader of a congregation in the East and principal of a secondary Jewish school. He had been asked by the Jewish Council in 41 to share the news of the young man who had been assembled and taken to concentration camp Mauthausen, who had caused the February strike. The fate was being killed. And my father was asked to share this together with the psychiatrist Musaf, walking the streets of the Jewish quarter. Every corner of the street, people started crying. And ever since, he had pleaded with everyone to find a hiding place. But for himself and for my mother, there were the parents who didn't want, and there was my birth. The SS man approached the cradle and looked in my eyes and said, Schade, dass ihr ein Jude ist. What a pity that this is a Jewish child. And my father retorted, he is fortunate to be a Jewish child because whatever will happen to him, he will never be a son of murderers. The man slapped my father, shouted abuse, dirty Jews, we cannot take you now, killing yourself, we come back tomorrow, shouting and disappearing. When a gaze of a baby can still penetrate in a heart filled with darkness of indoctrination, nothing is lost. He staged our refuge because by dawn my mother had put me in the baby carriage which then was taken by an unknown woman under the direction of Tini van der Bilt of the resistance movement out of sight my parents another direction I was taken in a suitcase with holes in it in a train to Arnhem. There I was safe, but not entirely, because neighbors started to speak. And so I had to be smuggled out and brought nearby Philip. Philip was an unabling place where so many people were taken in because leadership expanded itself in the hearts of people. The door was opened to me by Ria van der Kemp, a woman born in Germany, married now to a Dutchman, who had said in the Catholic Church, yes, I want to save children from the madness and the hatred of these Germans. There was a problem because there was another girl, Joke van Gelder, already 11 years old. It was not possible to have a baby and her in the same family. They found another place for her, and fortunately she survived. We were cared by Ria and by Bertus. As it is told, at a certain moment also when 
a sister came, Yvonne Roselaer, a year older than I was. She sometimes wandered around and neighbors saw her. There were members of the NSB, of the fascist party. And my Ria, my Muke, was able to convince the neighbors not to betray us. And Bertus, a nephew told me that one day he came to the home of his uncle and he saw the uncle sitting with me all his knees because, as the nephew said, he loved you so much. He put me down and then showed that under his sweater he had a kind of flask, a kind of container. It was filled with milk. In this way he smuggled milk for Yvonne and myself and was always there to help. In the meantime, my parents had found a refuge in a farm in Brabant. They didn't know where I was, but from time to time they received a postcard and it always said, Bobby is playing. Bobby is at sleep. And therefore they knew that I was safe. Their Shalometje was now Bobby. But one day the postcard stopped and my mother was desperate and she went on a train risking everything to find out from people in Amsterdam where I was. She was sent back with the terrible news that they had taken me, but she didn't dare to tell my father. And then one day a postcard came. Bobby is playing and she fainted. A miracle. At the end of the war, Forb Felp, in the midst of April 1945, we were in the cellar, and here I encounter my own memories. Blood, broken glass, shouting and screaming, fire. I could for a long time not put those fragments together. But I heard that my foster father, Bertus, had climbed the stairs to the outside to help with quenching fires that came from the grenades that came coming. And I must have climbed also to be out of the open. And then a grenade came and Bertus decided to protect me. He was killed. An injury. Burden? No. A liberating love. My father came to the door at the end of May 1945. And Muke said, you have come to take your son. Here he is. My father took me to my mother, who was just on the brink of birth of my brother David Menachem Baruch. And I encounter my memories. Running out of my home, getting lost in orphaned Amsterdam, not knowing where I belong. It is remarkable that the heritage of my parents was to build and rebuild Jewish communities. And I was so fortunate to find Sira, who had been saved by seven different families. And together, we have tried to continue that road. And one day, I received, after the death of my father many years after, 
My father died just before the re-inauguration of the former Portuguese synagogue in The Hague. Many years later, the letter that I received was from Amichai Hepner. I didn't know him. He wrote, I was hidden in a farm not far from your parents. I thought you died. But your father, I have to tell you, wrote on request of my father a kind of guide for Judaism. Hebrew lessons, Bible lessons, sermons, pictures. And I still have them. I have just given them to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And later on, I saw them in the museum. And the surprise was that they are written quickly in handwriting, that there are block letters sometimes. Sometimes it's Hashem, the name of God, Avraham. But this passage engraved in my heart, note my young friend, Na ase Adam, let us create the human being. God has created the human being for in the world together. But he gave the human being the task to perfect creation. So that creation would be a world filled with cooperation, love, truth, and righteousness. Uncomprehensible, the indomitable spirit of the Jewish people to continue with hope, part of the creation. And my father and mother and all who survived tried to build and rebuild communities. And I can say with Emunah Shlema that I believe with incomplete faith that together Israel will be saved and will have peace with its neighbors. And that in cooperation, we will create a world where no one is degraded. And it will happen that then God's prayer will be fulfilled by our deeds and the deeds of our children's children, children. Amen. Dear friends, we come to the conclusion of this commemorative event marking International Holocaust Remembrance Day here in The Hague. We take with us many memorable moments. As always, we hope to learn from the past to build a better future. Pursuing our general theme, the impact of the Holocaust on the development of international law, this year we focused on the idea of victims as witnesses. We are indebted to all those who contributed and shared with us their personal or professional insights into this difficult and important subject. First and foremost, we are grateful to those survivors who took the witness stand, particularly Rudy Cortesis and the children of the witnesses, Professor Salzberger and Professor Michman. The advisors and the acquaintances of the witnesses, Professor Howington Kata and Director Anamik Hinkholt. Their recollections of what took place on the witness stand carries a relevance that reaches far beyond the walls 
of the courthouse. We heard a moving testimony from a familiar face here in The Hague. As the rabbi of the liberal community, Avraham Sutendorp has often shared his story today in a very poignant way. As Chai, we thank our co-hosts, the municipality of The Hague, represented today by Mayor von Zanen, who gave us a glimpse of some of the treasures that are preserved in the municipal archive. And behind the scenes, by the Directorate of International Affairs, Martin Born. The Embassy of Israel in The Hague, represented today by Ambassador-designate, His Excellency Modi Ephraim, and behind the scenes by the legal department of Egail Frisch and Mirit Sharabi. Personally, I want to thank our fantastic team, Roy Cohen and Uncle Grun, Mendel Katzman, David Simon, Alan Stevens, and Carolina Twizer. The special envoy for Holocaust issues, Ms. Germain, focused on some of the legal issues and challenges confronting us when dealing with Holocaust denial. She made a point of emphasizing that the most effective way to counter Holocaust denial, distortion, and trivialization is by standing up for the truth and promoting accuracy. By highlighting and teaching the painful lessons of the Holocaust, including the importance of respecting human rights for all. If I may add, today we're honoring those who were victimized but refused to be victims. When the world abandoned them they ch and chose to look away, they continued to maintain faith and justice and stay focused. Their testimony did not only lead to the accusation of the perpetrators and save their past from disappearing into the abyss of the forgotten history, their testimony showed dignity and direction to a generation perplexed and confused in the face of unimaginable turmoil. Documents record events. History books chronicle historical developments. Monuments commemorate heroes and noteworthy occasions. It's the human story, the witness, that brings it to life. Those who took the witness stand did not only recall the darkness of their past, but cast a beacon of light on our future. The prophet Isaiah calls on all of us, Atem Eidai Nu'um Hashem. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. It is incumbent upon us, all of us, to act as witnesses for truth and justice, even at a time, especially at a time, when it's not so obvious and self-evident. We must attest to the inherent value of human life, the divine image that we carry with us deep in our soul, and let it shine upon all of humankind. May God bless the witnesses and their family, and may their courage be an inspiration for us and our children, never to be silent and never to be afraid. Shalom, and thank you for participating.